All right. All right, here we go. So hello, everyone. Welcome to All In On Real Estate. I'm your host, Aaron Goins. I started this meetup because when I was in the military, no one in my circles talked about real estate. A lot of times we talk about uh, other things about wealth, stocks, bonds, things like that, but nothing about real estate. So I want to start a meetup where people can learn about real estate um, and be educated about it and start building gener generational wealth for them and their family. So I'm really, really excited for my guest speaker today, somebody I, I uh, really admire. Um, I met this gentleman last year on his uh, classes that he did, that he did it consecutively, like every month he was doing a class. And uh, I really learned a lot from his capital raising calls. So Mr. Mr. Dave DeBall, how you doing, sir? Aaron, I'm fantastic. And thank you so much for the kind words and the privilege of speaking to your meetup group. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, man. And, and I really enjoy your podcast, too. I, I was forced to be on Dave's podcast as well. So, um, you know, this is really full circle for me. Awesome. So, so Dave, uh, I just want to start off. I asked every guest speaker this. Um, what is your origin story? How did you get started into real estate? Well, as you can see from the lack of hair and what's left is kind of gray. I've been around for a while and uh, got started in real estate, believe it or not, in Costa Rica, Central America of all places. I actually, I am, I'm Canadian from British Columbia, but after university, I ended up traveling around Mexico and Central America, settled down in Costa Rica, started a language training company down there, got married, had kids, lived in Costa Rica for 10 years and stumbled into a couple of what we would call pre-foreclosure deals while I was down there and uh, did those that worked pretty well. And then in 2003, I packed up my Costa Rican wife and our two Costa Rican kids and hauled them back to the frozen hinterlands of British Columbia, Canada. Everybody goes, Dave, what are you, crazy? What, what are you doing, man? <laughs> Costa Rica, tropical paradise, you know, live in maids, gardeners, gated communities, you know, all this kind of stuff. You can live a pretty good lifestyle for not that much money in, in Latin America. And then Canada. Why on earth would you do that? That's, you know, that's what people ask me. Well, here's the thing, you guys. You don't, have you ever heard, you don't realize what you've got till you leave it for a while? Has anybody ever experienced that? You know, you've been in the military, Aaron. I mean, anybody that's been in the military and traveled around, you see other countries, other places. You can appreciate what they've got, but it makes you appreciate what you've got a lot more as well. So here's the reality. Being the pasty-faced white dude that I am, whether you have money or not in Latin America, everybody assumes that you do. Does that make sense? So there's a target on your back. That your back and your, your family's backs as, as well. Now, Costa Rica is relatively speaking a pretty safe country, but there are these things like uh, kidnappings, you know, being held for ransom that does happen from time to time. I know two people it happened to. So in 2003, uh, my my daughter was getting towards school age. We decided, you know what? We want our kids to have a better environment, a safer environment, and to grow up in North America. So we packed everything up, moved to Canada, and started all over again from scratch. So I'd been gone so long, you guys. I didn't have I didn't have bad credit. I had zero credit. <laughs> I had to start all completely from scratch. I had been self-employed for quite a while, so I was pretty much unemployable. Who the heck would want to hire me, right? And I hadn't been able to sell my little language school in Costa Rica, so I didn't have very much money. So I was, I was starting all over from scratch in a br brand new town. I moved to a new town and had to quickly kind of figure out what am I going to do? Because I went from this good lifestyle in Costa Rica to renting a crappy little townhouse on the wrong side of the tracks in the in the city that we live in with my uh, persnickety now ex-wife, right? So she was kind of accustomed to the, the finer things in life. So I had to figure out what to do. And I was stressed out. I was late up late one night with insomnia. And I saw one of those infamous real estate infomercials. Do you guys remember any of the, anybody? You guys are all kind of young, but do you remember those? You too can get rich in real estate with little or no money down. <laughs> said perfect sign me up that's what i got little no little or no money so i got a course from a guy named ron legrand out of jacksonville florida anybody familiar with ron yeah a few people okay got this course and uh oh, binders and vhs <laughs> i think at that time the whole bit 
And I went through it. And my first little kick of the can is I did 18 deals in 18 months in the relatively small city I live in, which is Kamloops, which had about a, a population of about 80,000 people at that time. So that's when I first got into real estate investing, but I was doing all these creative, no money down type deals, didn't really need any capital. Uh, took some time off of active real estate investing for about five years as I helped a local Canadian guru kind of blow up his real estate training and investment company. Um, then I got back into it in about 2010, doing a strategy that actually required some capital. So by that time, I did have pretty good credit. I had some cash. I was able to self-finance my first couple of single family homes. And then, of course, that's when I hit the wall, ran out of cash, ran out of credit, couldn't do any more deals. And of course, that's when the perfect deal lands in your lap. Has anybody else ever had that? <laughs> you know, you run out of cash, you run out of credit, and that beautiful, perfect deal lands in your lap. That's what happened to me. And uh, I needed to raise $85,000 to close on that deal. I would heard, hey, just find a good deal. The money will find you. That didn't happen for me, Aaron. <laughs> so I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to have to do something. So I picked up the phone because I heard, hey, pick up the phone and dial for dollars, cold call people. Has so anybody heard that advice? I heard that advice too. So I tried it, called, 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 rejected, rejected, rejected. This sucks, this sucks, this sucks. And I, you know, I'd like to say I, I pounded through a couple of hundred calls and raised some money. I didn't. I pounded through about a dozen calls, got rejected, couldn't handle that much rejection. So I quit. And then I said, okay, well, I got to try something else. And somebody else told me, hey, well, Dave, if you got a good deal, it's pretty simple. Just go out and talk up your deal. Go out and network. Go out and turn every conversation into a real estate conversation. Try, try the 30-second commercial, your elevator pitch. Has anybody ever heard that advice before? Okay, so that's what I did. Went to the local B&I, Chamber of Commerce, Toastmasters, did my 30-second pitch on everybody, and guess how much capital I raised? Zero. <laughs> exactly, zero. 2020 hindsight, it's pretty obvious why. I was desperate. Like I was really running out of time. I was sweating. That desperation just kind of oozed through every pore in my body. It just turned people off. Didn't matter how good the deal was. All right. So I had to get a little extension on the subject removals on that property. And that's when I came up with a brainstorm. I said, hey, <laughs> brainstorm tongue in cheek. Hey, if enough people see this deal, it's going to sell itself. It's such a good deal. It's going to sell itself. So I did one smart thing and then I did one really stupid thing. The smart thing I did was I came up with a target group of a couple of hundred people that I wanted to focus on as prospective investors. So that was smart. The stupid thing I did was I put together a PDF outline of the deal talking about expected returns and all this kind of stuff. And I spammed that out to everybody cold, okay? I can remember, I sent that out on a Wednesday night. I said, awesome, this is gonna be so great. Thursday morning, I got up, looked at my inbox. I was thrilled that I got a number of replies until I started reading the replies. And they pretty much all said some variation of, hey, Debo, I haven't heard from you in forever. One guy hadn't heard from me in 18 years. 18 years, you guys. I haven't heard from me in forever. And here you are, hit me up for cash for a deal. Take a hike. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what happened you guys i lost that deal now that is not that big of a deal but at the time it was a big deal plus i live in a pretty small city so i had some major egg on my face i ticked off the seller big time i tied up the property for three weeks ticked off the realtor ticked off the mortgage broker ticked off my tenant that I already had lined up for this property just ticked everybody off and uh, not only that, I turned off a lot of really good prospective investors by being so clumsy about it. So after the smoke cleared, I gave my head a shake and I said, Dave, if there's one thing you do understand, you, you're, you're pretty good at marketing. Why don't you apply some intelligent marketing to this whole capital raising thing and see if that'll work? And so that's when I came up with what I call my money partner formula, which I'll be telling you guys about in this presentation. And by doing that, I raised several hundred thousand dollars for the single family home deals I was doing. Fast forward a few years, started getting into multifamily properties, raised several millions of dollars for that. But more importantly, uh, since then, since about 2016, I've been working with clients. We do uh, done for you marketing services for our clients. We've helped our clients cumulatively 
raised well over $300 million in counting for their deals. So that's what we're going to be talking about here today. That was a very long-winded explanation here, and I hope I, hope I didn't overwhelm you. No, you didn't. I, I, you dropped some great gems on there, too. I mean, uh, let me ask you this, because I've been in the same boat. Um, you said you call several, you know, a couple – dozen people and all knows yeah. what, what, what I mean, you know, how did you pivot? Because some people say, I'm done. I, 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 I didn't pivot. I, I didn't, I quit. <laughs> I was, I was that some person. I said, screw this. Right. I, I don't like cold calling. Uh, so I came up with a way that instead of me desperately chasing after investors, now let's use some marketing and let's get our investors coming to us. You know, I'm not going to say they're going to chase after you, but let's get them coming to us. Let's get them to put up their hand and self-identify, and then let's have a conversation. So that's what this whole process is about, is instead of chasing people, it's about attracting investors to you. Does that make sense, Aaron? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So I've never called cold called since. That's awesome. That is awesome right there. I love it. I love that. Um, so... Let me let me before we get to the uh, the formula, which I, I, I really like. Um, what has your experience been with coaching, uh, coaching up students? Uh, has it been frustrating or has it been I'm not saying I mean, never a seamless process, but it's been pretty smooth for you. Uh, no, I, it's it's been uh, coaching, just coaching. Doesn't work nicely for me because I'm not a naturally patient person. So we tried the whole training and coaching thing for a couple of years. And then I just got frustrated with people not taking action. So these days, instead of just doing coaching, what we do is we provide done for you services for our clients. So we actually go in and we set everything up for them so that we know it gets done and they actually take action. Does that make sense, Aaron? So it's now it's a combination of done for you services with some, I call it mentoring along the way versus just coaching. Right, right. And and uh, trust me, guys, I, I like his system. Uh, when he, we used to have, uh, well, I know you stopped a little bit now, but he had all day sessions about capital raising. And I learned so much from it. Uh, just um, the ways that they taught, taught us in the class, it was excellent. And, and like I said, that really attracted me to him. Um, so I know one thing about you. Um, how many how many deals have you been in? How many uh, real estate deals have you been in? Oh, uh, let's say, let's say multi-family. Let's say multi-family. Let's say what? Multi-family. multi-family. Okay, yeah. multi-family. Not a heck of a lot. I'm more of a passive investor these days, Aaron. So yeah. I've been involved in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different multi-family deals at this point. So what's been your biggest, your biggest change for you from going from single family to multifamily, just the deal structure and things like that for you? You know what? It's, um, it is different. It depends on the size of the project that we're getting involved in. I haven't been involved in any big syndication type deals. They tend to be smaller multifamily properties. A couple of the properties we're involved in right now, you know, they're smaller deals, sixplex type properties, but they're kind of interesting. They're furnished uh, medium term rentals. Mm. So instead of short term rentals, they're actually medium term rentals in areas of the country that have a high demand with uh, workforces. So people flying into certain areas and working for a couple of weeks on, a couple of weeks off, that sort of uh, that sort of thing. That's what I've I've involved in right now. So how so um, prior to COVID, how was the market, and then after COVID, how was the market? Because I see now we're starting to travel a little bit more, but how was the market? prior to COVID and then, um, you know, for the medium term um, after COVID? Well, not well the, marketing, the marketing in Canada pre-COVID depends like the states, right? So different areas have different markets and it depends on where you're investing and it, it, it's, very, it's variable. Uh, during COVID, I, my very rusty crystal ball, foggy crystal ball, I thought things were going to tank, right? I thought everybody's going to be losing their jobs, you know, da, 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 da. We're going to go into a massive recession. Well, obviously I was wrong. <laughs> and the, the real estate market has just taken off pretty much a, across the entire country. So uh, Canada has been kind of crazy. The, 
the average house price, single family home price in Canada is over $700,000 now. So prices have just gone absolutely insane. Mm. Okay, so uh, you got into the podcast. Why, why, why start a podcast? Well, because for a long time, Aaron, I was, I, I've got quite a, a list of followers. I've got about 10,000 people on my email list. And for, for a long time, I was always trying to come up with new content uh, to be providing people, to be providing value and, and keep in touch with folks. And quite frankly, it got to be a lot of work. So then I heard about this whole podcasting thing and I said, hey, why don't I talk to smart people like Aaron and other guests, ask them some questions, and then they provide the content for me. <laughs> so that's why I got into podcasting was number one, it was a great way to meet other very cool, intelligent real estate influencers. And number two, it's a great way to provide content for my followers. Um, wow, I'm basically out. I mean, I mean before we go to the, um, what, where, where you want to see yourself in the next couple of years uh, for you and your business? You know what? I love what I'm doing. I plan on chugging along, keep going as planned with what I'm doing right now. I really enjoy what I do. Okay, cool, cool, cool. You want to uh, get into the money partner for formula? You got it, my friend. Thank you. Let's see if I can share my screen. Give me a thumbs up if you can see that all right. Yes, sir. All right, perfect. All right, you guys, so we're going to be talking today about how to leverage your network and raise $150,000 or more in a few weeks and potentially one to 1.5 million or more in a few months. And this is something that is quite common with the clients that we work with. Another title for this presentation might be how to raise a million bucks from friends and family without it being weird. <laughs> Who likes that title? I kind of like that title. I just gave up for that with that for you guys. So that's what this is all about. And um, the reason we do this is we worked with a lot of real estate investors and we found that the same challenges kind of come up over and over and over again. At least they did for me, right? So not having enough capital on hand to do as many or big of deals as you want to, especially if you're self-financing. So that means that you're going to stay stuck with a small, small portfolio that doesn't pay the bills, right? Doesn't cut it. So if you're stuck with a small portfolio, that means you might have to keep punching the clock at a JOB that you're not particularly thrilled about. And it gets to be a challenge, right? If you're trying to do a job, you're trying to manage your portfolio, you're trying to find deals, you're trying to find investors, you're trying to you know, be a good parent and a good spouse, that's a lot of pressure all at the same time. So these are the biggest challenges people are facing these days, right? So again, we, what we find that people are really looking for is having easy access to capital to go and buy more properties, do more deals, not going through being rejected over and over again. Most folks don't have a strong sales background. They don't have that thick skin that you know hardcore sales type people need to have. They don't wanna be rejected. They don't wanna look uh, foolish, especially with friends and family. And they're looking for a way to bring on investors in capital, ideally on autopilot, and speak to people that are really interested, pre-qualified, pre-motivated, and predisposed to invest, all right? So we already talked a little bit about myself and my background. Um, I've authored or co-authored, you can see back there, eight different books on marketing and real estate investing. I've uh, been interviewed on over 50 leading real estate podcasts over the last few years. Uh, and I've shared the stage with some pretty cool people. You guys recognize who that guy is? Big George, he invented a grill, punched the lights out of a lot of people, world champion twice, 20 years apart. Believe it or not, you guys, he's sitting down in that picture and I'm standing up. That's how big that dude is. He is absolutely huge. Uh, Stefan Arneo, good friend of mine, late great Stefan Arneo. Uh, somebody who's a little bit more my size, Stature-wise, uh, Robert Herjavec from the Dragon's Den and uh, Shark Tank, Ted Thomas, and Rich Dad, Poor Dad author himself, Robert Kiyosaki. So I've had the pleasure of sharing the stage. But all of that's great. But the, the real reason that you might want to hear me out is how I've been able to help other real estate investors. So for example, Rick, who was a pretty new investor when we started working with him, he had one deal under his belt, negative cash flowing. He got more education about real estate investing. 
and raising capital took massive action and went from one single family home to 19 single family homes, each with a different investment partner. And he was doing the Burr strategy. So buying a single family home, putting a suite in the, in the basement. And then he was cash flowing $900 a month per property after he paid into his investors and everybody else. So I'm not sure what that comes out to 19 times 900, but it's pretty darn good. He did all of that with investors in their capital. Mark, a more experienced real estate investor, uh, when I met him, he was transitioning, kind of like Maria, what you want to be doing. He was going from single family homes and condos into multifamily properties. He had experience raising capital, but not for bigger deals. Uh, so we worked together, raised very, very quickly $440,000 for his first apartment building deal. Six months later, he found a bigger, better deal. We rinsed and repeated the process, raised over a million dollars for that second deal. And that second one is the one that got him out of the rat race. That's the one that replaced. Now his, his portfolio income exceeded his job income. He was able to quit the job and focus on real estate. And then we've also worked with some uh, very experienced real estate investors like John and Paul. These guys had already been raising capital for a long time for bigger deals, doing self-storage facilities in Georgia. Uh, but they were kind of tired of dialing for dollars, network schmoozing, doing all the traditional stuff. So we quickly applied the money partner formula with them. And they very, very quickly raised 1.5 million by attracting investors instead of chasing after them. And since then, they've sold off their entire portfolio and have sailed off into the sunset financially, which is kind of what we're all looking to do. So, Eric, can I do something a little different with you guys? Are you up for that? Yes, sir. Yeah. So why is having access to private capital so important? Would you guys like to see what the lifetime worth of an investor could be for you? Is anybody interested in that? This is kind of, this is what I, I'm not a math guy, but this is fun with math. Is anybody interested in seeing what the lifetime worth of an investor would be for you? This is not theoretical. Okay, Robert's up for it. All right, perfect. Maria, are you up for this as well? Yep. Okay, so Aaron, I'm going to ask for your help. And let's see if I can do this properly. Okay, so Aaron, are you okay with playing along with me here? Yes, so, sir. What strategy should we focus on? Let's keep it kind of simple. So it could be, um, what are you focusing on these days, Aaron? Let's just use uh, multifamily. From, what from size? Uh, I'll say 100 plus units. Okay, well, let's do something a little smaller just to keep the math simpler. Is that okay? So can we do this multi, multi, what's that? 60. Well, let's say even, uh, let's say we did, have you got any experience with like an eight plex or a six plex or something like that? No, sir, but we can do that. Okay. Right. Well, let's, we got a whole bunch of people here. So you guys participate, go ahead, type in the chat box. What do you think your net profit on, let's say an eight plex would be over a 10 year time frame? And we, we're just going to guesstimate here. So your net profit on an eight plex over a 10 year time frame, when you take into account cash flow, you take into account mortgage pay down, you take into account appreciation of the property, you take into account any forced appreciation you might have on that property. What do you think realistically your profit before taxes would be on a deal like that? Any ideas? Go ahead, type that in the chat box. Oh, we got oh, we got people typing in there. Okay, let's see what we got. 200K, 80K for an eightplex. I would hope it'd be a lot more than 80K. If we're taking all of the profit centers, not just cash flow, all the different profit centers. 800K, 700K. Okay, well, let's say, to keep the math simple, let's say it's the 800K. You guys okay with that? 800,000? Okay, let's, let's put in that. Now, you're going to be sharing your profits with your investor partners. Let's say your investors have put in all the money. You've done all the work. You're going to share the profits. Should we say 50-50 to keep it simple? Is that okay, you guys? 50-50? So your half of 800,000 would be what? 400,000, right? And forgive my messy writing here, but I'm doing this with a mouse. Okay. So what price point do we think we'd be looking at for an eightplex? I know it's going to depend market to market all across the country. What are we looking at for a price point for a, an eightplex, give or take? Cedric, you might be able to help us out with that. Say maybe, you know, we'll just say 500,000. 
five hundred thousand for an aplex. Let's can we be super conservative and say a million bucks? Yeah, let's be super conservative. Okay, so let's say it's costing us a million because I got to keep my my math simple here. <laughs> so a million bucks. Let's say we're not doing too much work on this. So how much do you guys need for down payment and closing costs, property transfer taxes, expenses, et cetera? What do you think it would cost to get into a million dollar eight plex, give or take? What do you guys think? What did you say? 250,000. 250,000? Yeah. So round it up, let's say 300,000 with a few renovations and stuff like that. That'd be okay. Bit of a contingency fund, something like that. So $300,000, that's what we need to get into a property like this. So I'm gonna suggest we're probably gonna need more than one investor to do a deal like that. Would you guys agree? Probably more than one investor. So if we got, let's say two investors with $150,000 each, would that be within the realm of reason? Okay, so let's say we need two investors to do one of those kind of deals. Now, has anybody here worked with investors already? Nobody, not yet. Cedric, you have? Okay. Have you worked with anybody on kind of a long-term basis? Just... Uh, we're, right now, I think we're about uh, a year and a half into it. I don't know if that's considered long or not. Okay. Well, what's your best guess on how many deals an investor would do with you? You know, if you're doing a good job with them over the lifetime of your working relationship with that person. Like if you do what you say you're going to do, how often do you think they would reinvest or how many deals would they do with you over time? I think See, that if we did oh, go ahead, we Maria. Said, yeah, go ahead, Maria. If we said what we were going to do, they're going to tell their friends. Well, we'll, we'll look at that in a minute, but let's just say them personally. How many, how many $150,000 is, are they going to invest and reinvest with us, do you think? As long as we keep doing a good job, they should keep coming back. Okay, but we're gonna have to try and peg it down. So how about if we be conservative? Should we, con go ahead, Cedric. Five deals. You're gonna say five deals. Cedric's gonna say five deals. How about if we be super conservative? And let's say, let's say they do two deals with us over time. Would that be pretty conservative? It's probably gonna be higher. Would you agree it's probably gonna be higher? But let's be conservative. I don't wanna be pie in the sky. So two deals over time. Now, Maria, let's take a look at referrals. So we're doing a good job for our investor. How many other investors do you think they will lead us to? How many of their friends and family members do you think will come on board and invest with us? Let's say six. Six, holy smokes. All right, anybody else? 10? Oh my goodness. Okay, you guys, I'm gonna be super, super conservative. Super conservative. So here's what I'm gonna say. Let's say when we're talking about referrals, let's say we get one referral for every two investors that we have. That would be 0.5. Does that make sense? So we get okay. one referral for every two investors. So our actual referral multiplier is 1.5. All right, so let's plug in the numbers and see what we're looking at. So first number we got is what that kind of a deal is worth to us over time, 400,000, right? Then we have to divide that by the number of investors that we need to do a deal like that. And again, we're trying to figure out what's the lifetime worth of one investor to us. So $400,000, we need two investors to do a deal like that. Then we're gonna multiply it by the number of times an investor is going to reinvest with us, which we've said conservatively would be two. You guys are saying three, four, five times, but let's be super conservative, all right? And then if we do a, a mediocre job at getting referrals, let's say for every one, in, for every two investors, we get one referred investor. That means one investor would be the worth, the equivalent of one and a half, right? So our referral factor is 1.5. So let's help me out with the math here. 400 divided by two brings us down to 200,000. Multiplied by two brings us back up to 400,000 times 1.5 brings us to what? What's the number there, you guys? 600,000. 600,000 dollars. 
Does this seem familiar, Aaron? We did this exercise in the full day workshop. I thought I'd, I thought I'd pull it out here for you guys. It does. It does. Yeah. Six hundred thousand dollars. You guys are not looking very impressed. <laughs> I don't know what it takes to excite you folks. $600,000 profit in your pocket is what an investor is worth conservatively in this scenario. Okay? $600,000. Now, let's put this in perspective. How long does it take the average American to save up $600,000? Here's the answer. Never. It's never going to happen right? Okay. The average, the, the average income, gross income before taxes in the States is somewhere right around $45,000 a year. Okay. So $600,000. This is why we are in the business of real estate investing. Does that make sense, you guys? Is that a helpful little exercise? So now that we know how much um, an investor is worth to us, Who's interested in going out and getting some? Who didn't understand the question? <laughs> shall, we, shall we take a look at how to go get some? All right, you guys. So let's take a look at what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the importance of your investor list and who to have on it, how to get people coming to you instead of you chasing after them, and then how to have effective investor meetings. We'll do a quick little demo. I'll invite you to book a one-on-one -on -one call if you'd like our help to actually make this happen. And we'll also give you some free stuff at the end. Anybody interested in free stuff? Likes, Maria likes that idea. All right. Robert, you like that idea? You like some free stuff too, brother? Oh, of course. All right. Perfect. Thanks for being here. Okay, guys. So let's talk a little bit about your target group of prospective investors. Now, let's, let's put this in, in perspective as well, you guys. What we're really talking about here is when you're getting started with raising capital. I'm not talking about doing huge syndications right off the get-go. I'm not talking about raising gazillions of dollars right off the get-go. I'm talking about if you're just getting started with, with uh, raising capital, this is the most intelligent way to go about doing it. Does that make sense, you guys? Okay, so what is your investor list? It is, we want to create a target group of approximately 200 people. 200 people that are in our network. We have a pre-existing relationship with these folks. You know them, they know you, okay? Now, if you're freaked out about that and you say, I don't know 200 people, I'll show you in a few minutes where to find these people. So don't worry about that, okay? Now, why are we gonna focus on your network, your existing network? Several reasons. Number one, it's the fastest way to get the capital. Number two, it's the easiest way to get the capital. And number three, it's the safest way to get that initial capital, all right? Because you gotta think about it. We need to be logical. If you've never worked with an investor before, and you're trying to go out to strangers and raise capital from, let's say, accredited investors, why on earth would anybody invest with you if you don't have a track record working with investors? Does that make sense, you guys? So we got to start somewhere. And this is the most logical, the fastest, the safest, and the easiest place to get started. All right. So what we want to do is we want to collect these pokes, we want to organize them, and we want to get them into an automated email system or a CRM program. That's what we want to do it so that we can be efficient with our communications. All right. So step number one is let's create this list of prospective investors, get names and email addresses of people that are in our network and set them up in a CRM system. Okay. So again, why this is so important in order for somebody to invest that 50, a hundred, $150,000 with you, they're going to need to know you like you and trust you with their money, right? It's just logical, you guys. No like and trust. So we're going after your existing network. They already know you. Hopefully they already like you. And to a certain degree, they already trust you, right? So we're working, we're, we're getting momentum already by focusing on this group, okay? Here's a great example. This is Cheyenne. Cheyenne was a professional getting into real estate investing. He'd done a few deals, ran out of cash, ran out of credit and wanted to raise some capital. He was very nervous about this whole thing. He said, Dave, I don't really know if I wanna reach out to my network, my friends, my family members, people that I used to work with. He did it anyhow, came up with a list of about 180 people, uh, did what we call the warm up campaign, which I'll explain to you in a few minutes, and had over 100 people get back to him. He actually 
he actually got his first two investors within four weeks of starting the process and never looked back. So it works really, really well, you guys, focusing on this group of people. Okay, so once we've got that target group of people ready to go, next thing we need to do is we need to get going with the communications, right? And there's all sorts of ways to do these. We'll be talking about a few of them. We want to get started on the right foot. So if you guys remember my sad story back in the day when I was trying to raise capital, one of the things I did was I came up with that target group, but then I spammed everybody with my deal. Remember that? And just had a bunch of people that got turned off. So what we want to do instead is we want to break the ice with these people. We want to reconnect with them on a personal level first before we start talking business. Reconnect before you start talking business. And there's a very efficient way to do this via email. I'll show you about that in a few minutes as well. Once we've got that done, the next thing we want to do is we're going to set everything up to automate our communications. Who likes the idea of investor meetings popping up on your calendar on autopilot? Anybody like that idea? That's what we want to set up here. And the way to do that is through constant, consistent, what I call edutaining communication. Edutaining communication. So this is really, really important, you guys. If you're taking notes, write this down. Who's ever heard of the KISS formula? K-I-S-S. -S. KISS formula, what does it stand for? Keep it super simple. That's exactly right, Robert. <laughs> Keep it super simple, right? Because here's what we need to remember. You and I and Aaron and everybody on this call we are what I affectionately refer to as real estate weirdos. I say that with love and affection. I am one. You are one. Why do I say that? Because here you are spending your Thursday afternoon or evening on Zoom with us learning about real estate. Everybody else is watching Netflix or something else. Does that make sense, you guys? So here's what we've got to remember. Most of our friends and family are not real estate weirdos like us. In fact, the statistic I've heard and read is that 95% of the general population has never invested in a revenue property before. Their own house does not count. 95% of the general population has never invested in a revenue property before. Okay? So we got to keep that into, into mind. So a big mistake I see people making with their marketing is they over-educate people. They assume that because I'm passionate about real estate, everybody wants to know everything I know about it. That's not true. So they go out, they, they send out way too much stuff, too techy, too much data, too many numbers, too many charts and graphs, and people zone out and they unsubscribe. Does that make sense, you guys? So take Robert's advice. Keep it super simple. Here's what I call it. Keep it Reader's Digest level. Reader's Digest, if you remember, was a magazine. Back in the day, it was written for grown-ups. However, it was written at a 13-year-old comprehension level. That means it was super easy to read and consume. We want our stuff to be the same way, easy to understand, so that the average 13-year-old can get it. That's a good benchmark. Does that make sense, you guys? So keep it super simple. Different ways that's, that are really working well for our clients these days, weekly communication. So something should be coming out every week from you to your list of a couple hundred prospective investors. Uh, what we do for our clients is the first week of the month, a electronic newsletter goes out, what we call an e-zine, electronic newsletter. Second week, a blog post comes out. Third week, a video log comes out. Fourth week, another blog post comes out. And then the next month, e-zine, blog, video log, blog. Ding, 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 ding. Short, sweet edutaining so a little bit educational hopefully a little bit entertaining and each piece of marketing has a clear call to action each piece of marketing has a clear call to action people say dave how do you get people popping up on your calendar it's easy i tell them to book a call hey if you're interested in finding out more click on the link below book a call let's have a conversation see if this is a good fit for you does that make sense you guys so that weekly edutaining communication, okay? So why this works? Well, what we're gonna be doing is we're edutaining people, we're educating them over time 
We're creating curiosity. We're getting them to put up their hand and self-identify, right? So that way, when they book that call, they're going to be coming to you. They're already going to be a little bit pre-educated. They're going to be curious. They're going to be motivated. They're going to want to find out more. Plus, you've already got that pre-existing relationship. They already know you. They already like you. And the more of your marketing they see, the more they're going to trust you as a real estate pro, okay? So make sure that marketing is educating and always have that clear call to action. Tell people exactly what you want them to do. And guess what? Eventually, some of them will. You won't get a whole slew of them right off the get-go, but if you keep this up drip by drip by drip, you're going to start getting those appointments popping up in your calendar. Does that make sense, you guys? You know this. You know this from all areas of your life. The more consistent you are, the more clarity and the more consistency you have about something, the better results you're going to get, okay? Now, examples, uh, investor-focused website, your online marketing hub, electronic newsletters, video logs, three to five minutes long, pretty short, keep them very, very focused. Blog posts, these are all the things that are working really well. Webinars uh, working really well for our clients. Here's a great example. Karina and Dave, <clears throat> they are doing interesting development deals, kind of like infill type deals in a, a, major, a major city. They were doing little deals, self-financed at the beginning. Now they're starting to really build into much, much bigger projects because they followed this process. And it worked so well for them that Karina actually built up a group of investors lined up, ready to go for her deal. So my motto is always raise the capital first and then go looking for the deals. Have the capital lined up, then go looking for the deal. So now Karina is at the point when she's got a deal ready to go, she's got this core group of people who've already self-identified and said, hey, I want first dibs. When you've got a deal, she just sends out a brief little information package to them and says, hey, first come, first serve. And they come to her and say, hey, I'm in for 150 grand. I'm in for 300 grand. I'm in for 400 grand, that sort of thing. So she very, very quickly raised over 1.5 million and hasn't looked back uh, following this process, you guys. All right. Third part is you want everything we do focuses on having a solid investor presentation, a solid investor meeting, right? This is where the rubber hits the road. You can do everything else right, but when somebody puts up their hand and actually meets with you and you walk them through your presentation, this is what it's all about. Does that make sense, you guys? This is where it's all about. You want to have these conversations. So what I've found has worked really well is instead of just trying to wing it, you know, and take a yellow legal pad and a Sharpie and try and draw some diagrams and stick figures, what works better is to have a well-organized slide deck presentation, what I call your million dollar investor presentation. And again, really important to keep it simple, right? Just like Robert said, keep it super simple. Because again, we want to we want to present this to people who are not super astute when it comes to real estate investing. So if you confuse them, a confused mind says no, okay? And then our whole goal is to be setting up one-on-one -on -one meetings, either meeting with people at your office, at a coffee shop, at their place, or meeting them online via Zoom. Now you can do one-on-one -on -one meetings and once you're comfortable with it, which should be pretty soon, you can start doing online group presentations, which really leverages the whole process, okay? So your investor meeting, this is what it's all about. And your success in raising capital is 100% dependent on you having a really good slideshow presentation, a, a, a pitch deck it's sometimes called, and having successful investor meetings. So everything we're talking about here is designed to get you that meeting. And we've got a really good presentation. It works like gangbusters. This is a great example. This is Bruno. Bruno is originally from Mexico, fairly new to the country, didn't have a lot of contacts, didn't have a lot of experience. He had some experience doing real estate in Mexico. He, he followed this process, got an investor presentation, and very his very first go using a good slide deck like that, raised $200,000, all right? So this stuff can work very, very well, you guys. Jamie and Leslie Collar, another great example. These two started off when I first met them, had two single family homes that they had self-financed. One was just a, a regular rental, a single family home. The other one had a basement suite. So they had three rental units and they very, very quickly raised their first $120,000 within I think the first month. And they just kept going. Their first year, they went from three doors to 47 doors. Their second door year, they went from 47 to 88 doors. Uh, last time I heard, these guys were buying a resort in Curacao in the Caribbean 
and just at, with investor capital, just absolutely loving it and crushing it with real estate investing. Okay. Uh, ben and Tanya, these guys follow the whole process, raised very, very quickly, raised $1.5 million in a number of months to do this. Uh, we've got all sorts of case studies and examples here, you guys. If you want to go to moneypartnerformula.com forward slash results, you can check some of those out there and see which, uh, which people kind of resonate with you. Okay. Does that make sense, you guys? Now, we're going to open up for Q&A in just a few minutes. But first, let me do a quick little demo of how this whole process works, just so you got kind of a visual idea of it. So if you remember, our, our goal is let's start with a target group of 200 prospective investors. Is anybody here a little bit nervous thinking you might not know 200 people? Be honest. Anybody worried about that? Nope, Maria's not. You're a, a social butterfly. You know where everybody is. Well, here's what we do with our clients because quite often they say, Dave, you know what? I don't know 200 people. Chances are you do. So what we do is we do a data dump, a data dump. We get all of your contacts from your cell phone, your email contacts, your social media contacts, any business cards or old address books you've got, get them all into one place. And now chances are you're probably going to start with a couple of thousand people. And then our job is let's whittle it down to a couple of hundred people who you legitimately have a connection with, right? So you start with a couple of thousand people, but you quickly go through that list. When we're doing this with our clients, it takes about 45 minutes. You just see a name. If a face pops into your mind and you like that face, keep them. You see a name, you've got no clue who that person is, delete. Keep, 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 delete, delete, delete. Whittle it down to 200 people. You guys follow me here? Is this making sense? Okay, that's how we create that list of 200 people. And we want to get, make sure we got names and email addresses. Get them up into that CRM system so that we can efficiently communicate with them one to many, okay? So once, let's wave the magic wand, let's pretend you've got that list put together, you've got it set up in the CRM system. Now, we want to avoid what Dumb Dumb Dave did back in the day, just charge it in like the bull in the china shop, and we want to reconnect with these people on a personal level first. Follow me here, you guys? Reconnect with them on a personal level first. Now, we want who would agree that you would rather do this in an efficient way versus trying to book a phone call with 200 different people. Yes, all right, so let's use an efficient way to do this. We're gonna do that through email communication. We're gonna send out three simple emails. The first two of them, we're gonna kind of shake things up. A couple of emails are gonna be just regular emails. We're gonna have a couple of videos in there. We're gonna kind of mix it up a little bit so it's different mediums and it just works much, much better, okay? So the first couple of communications are just kind of warm and fuzzy. Hey. It's Dave. It's probably been a while since we connected. Just want to reach out, say hi, see how you're doing, let you know what I've been up to. Here's what I've been up to for the last few years, blah, 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 blah. Me, the kids, the family, the wife, trips, COVID, good stuff, not so good stuff, blah, blah, blah. You know, just kind of a quick little summary of what you've been up to. Not talking about real estate, not trying to be sneaky and NL people, NLP people into, you know, investing with us. We're just having a genuine connection. And then here's the key, write this down. At the end of these communications, say, well, that's what I've been up to. How about you? How are you doing? Please hit reply to this email. I'd love to connect. Send that out to all 200 people. You guys follow me there? Okay, so those first two messages, that's like that. Then your job is <clears throat> to respond to people. And don't worry, if you've got 200 people on your list, not all 200 are going to respond to you. In fact, you'll be doing really good if you get about, typically we're seeing about 20 to 30 responses. Okay, that's pretty typical. Now, 20 to 30 is awesome because there is money in those connections. There is capital in those connections. Does that make sense, you guys? So your job is make sure when people reply to you that you have a little bit of back and forth with them. Okay, so once we've done that, the third message is critical. I call this your transition message. This is your transition <laughs> message. It's going to give people the heads up that we're going to switch gears we're going to stop just being all warm and fuzzy. And we're going to start talking about real estate. We're going to start talking business, right? So we're going to give people the heads up that the communications are going to change. So when I'm doing a transition message, it sounds something like this. Hey, it's Dave. It's been really good reconnecting with you over the last few weeks. I just want to let you know that moving ahead, I plan on doing a much better job of staying in touch and letting you know what I'm up to with real estate investing. Real estate is something I'm very passionate about. I'm doing really well with it. And in fact, you know what? I think real estate is the best way for everyday folks like you and like myself 
to get an above average return on our money backed by something solid, something tangible, and that's real property. Now, who knows? Maybe sometime in the future, you might even want to partner with me and share in some of the profits on a deal. But you know what? If you're really not interested in real estate, that's okay too. You can always click unsubscribe at the bottom of any of my emails. You'll be taken off my list immediately. My feelings will be devastated for a little while, but eventually I'll get over. It, okay. Now, in the meantime, if you haven't had a chance to get back to me, please hit reply to this email. I'd love to connect. Take care. Talk to you soon. Send that out to all 200 people. That makes sense, you guys? So that is the transition message. So we're telling them that we're going to do a better job of staying in touch. We're going to be letting them know what we're up to with real estate investing. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. You might want to even join me sometime in the future, sharing the profits, okay? But if you're not interested, click on subscribe. And if you haven't got back to me, love to hear from you. Does that make sense, you guys? Now, we send this out. Let's say we have a list of 200 people. And we just told people to unsubscribe if they'd rather not hear from us. Go ahead, type in the chat box, what is your best guess? If we had 200 people, how many of them are going to unsubscribe? Aaron, you're not allowed to answer because you've been in my training before. <laughs> All right, you guys, what's your best guess? Out of 200 people, how many of them are going to drop off? Go ahead, type that in the chat box just so I can see what your, what your best guess is. And then I'll let you know what our experience has been because we've done this literally a couple of hundred times right now uh, with all sorts of different people. Okay, so we got all sorts kind of going down. 150, 75, 20, 15, 35%. All right, very good. Thanks you guys for playing along. You wanna know what the reality has been? Doing this a couple of hundred times with different clients at this point, we find on average, that there are between four and six people who drop off. Not percent, four to six people who drop off. It's very, very low. So some of you guys thought 150 or 75 people are gonna opt out. Here's why I think, I'm not sure exactly why it's so low, but here's my suspicion. Number one, it's because we're going out to people that we already have a pre-existing relationship with. You already know them. They already know you. Does that make sense, you guys? So that's reason number one. Reason number two is because we piqued their curiosity. Hey, who knows? Maybe sometime in the future, you might even want to partner with me and share in the profits on a deal. Ooh, profits. That perks people's ears up, right? And then the third reason might be because we kind of give them a little bit of a guilt trip. If you want to opt out, go ahead, click on the unsubscribe. My feelings will be devastated for a while, but eventually I'll get over it. I say that tongue in cheek, but again, it kind of gives people a little bit of a guilt trip. Are you going to get more people dropping off over time? Yeah, a few, but not a ton. Okay. So typically this works really, really well, you guys. If you want to reconnect with people in a systematic, automated way, this is the best way I've ever seen to do it. Is this making sense, you guys? Now, the warm up campaign is not designed to get people booking meetings with you. It's not designed for that. However, here's the fun thing. We find that in about half of the cases, in other words, with about half of the clients that we work with, that's exactly what happened. In fact, this happened with uh, just last week with Heather, a new client that we just started this process with. Heck, she had a, quite a small list. She only had about 135 people on her list. Uh, she had a grand total of five people drop off, but she had three people reach out to her and say, hey, Heather, I didn't know you're doing real estate. That's cool. I'd like to find out more. Just from this warm-up campaign, even though it's not designed for that, three people reached out directly. She booked three meetings from the warm-up campaign. Who'd like to get those kind of results? Who thinks that'd be pretty cool? Nobody? Who did not, who did not understand the question? I'm, <laughs> all right, you guys. It can work really, really well, even though it's not designed for that. Okay, so there we go. We got our target group. We reconnect with them. And now it's time to start the marketing. Now it's time to put the gasoline on the fire. It starts with your website. And then you've got that weekly edutaining marketing with uh, e-zines, blog posts, video logs, blog posts. So drip, drip, drip every single week. Something's coming out with a clear call to action. Hey, if you'd like to find out more, click on the link below, book a call. Let's have a conversation. Is this making sense, you guys? So this is what it's all about. This is the whole process in a nutshell, okay? 
And this is what's going to get, you know, if you do this constantly and consistently, <clears throat> this is what it, what's going to start getting you those investor meetings popping up on your calendar. This really is uh, the combination to the vault, you guys. Okay. And this is what I call the money partner formula, right? So we start off with the foundation of creating that list of your ideal investors, <clears throat> setting up your website, setting up your investor presentation. Then we launch things. We start the marketing. We launch with that warm up campaign. Then we get you some practice runs on your belt with what I call the ninja strategy. We do those, uh, get the marketing going with the constant, consistent communication. Then once we got that up and going, now it's time to leverage things, right? Our favorite word in real estate, leverage. So the way we leverage things is we start doing one to many presentations instead of just one-on-one -on -one presentations. We keep things rolling and we really kick things into gear with that ongoing communication, the consistency of the communication. And then we work on different ways to amplify your credibility, be seen as a real estate expert in the eyes of your 200 prospective investors. Okay. So you guys, uh, like I was talking about with Aaron, we have a variety of different services that we offer people. We don't just really do coaching or training. We provide done for you marketing services to get all of this stuff set up and help you every step of the way along here. Uh, we've got different packages, different programs, depending on your level, uh, starting anywhere from $5,000 up to $20,000, depending on what your needs are. Okay. So if you're interested in that, uh, the people that we work with are active real estate investors who have at least one successful deal under their belt. We work with people who are willing to be 100% fair and above board with their investor partners. They're going to treat their investors' capital as if it were their own. And we like to work with people who are cooperative, coachable, and pleasant to work with. So even though we're doing the vast majority of everything for you, obviously, we still need your input, your cooperation to get it all going and make it happen, okay? So you guys, if you're interested in having a conversation about this, uh, you can visit the site, bookachatwithdave.com. Let's see, I'll just get that URL here. I put that in the chat box. You can pick a day and a time that uh, works well for you and we'll make that happen. Let me make that. Bookachatwithdave.com. And uh, during that call, we're gonna, Really laser focus in on what your goals are, your ambitions, what you want to accomplish, the time frame. We'll take a look at different ways for you to make that happen and see if it's a good fit for us to be working with you. If you're, we're a good fit for you and if you're a good fit for us as well. And if so, uh, we'll invite you to become a client. All right. But no pressure, no high pressure stuff like that. Okay. If you're interested in getting some free stuff, go ahead, check out my main website, moneypartnerformula.com. Moneypartnerformula.com. You can download a free copy of my book, Money Partner Formula, in exchange for your name and your email address. You can see some success stories. You can get some free training. Uh, you can book a call through that site as well, if you'd like. Okay, there you go. That's what I've got for you, Aaron. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Uh, love it. So anybody have any questions for Dave? I apologize. I went five minutes over. Any questions for Dave? I left them all dumbfounded, Aaron. I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> so look, uh, how how much long you you got on here, Dave? Uh, how much longer can you stay? I'm I'm here. At, I'm at your at your pleasure, my friend. Okay. So look, uh, <clears throat> there's Cedric. I think Cedric might have a question. Go ahead, Cedric. Okay. Yeah. Yes, uh, Dave. If you could, could you just go back over your done for you system again? Well, what I would suggest, Cedric, is let's book a call because not everybody's interested in that. But basically, everything that we just showed you, plus a lot more, we set it all up for you. So all the way from extracting all of your contacts and creating your database and cleaning it up for you and getting it set up in a CRM system and your website and your slide deck presentation and your e-zines, video logs, blog posts, your webinars, all of that stuff we do for you and with you. Heck, with your webinar, I'll even be your sidekick. You know, I'll make you shine. I'll pump your tires. I'll take care of all the techie stuff. So we, we make it as easy as possible for, for people, especially if they're not super techie, if they don't have a marketing background, if they're not super comfortable with, uh, with sales. We set all of that stuff up for you. We practice it, role play it, rehearse it with you. And then we debrief with you after all of this. So it's a, it's a real holistic approach to helping you to leverage your existing network and to raise that 
$150,000 in as little as a few weeks, one, 1. 1.5 million is quite common within six to 12 months. Okay, awesome. All right, thanks. My pleasure. So yeah, my ma thoughts are that I'm not the type of person that wants to evict anybody. Um, I'm sorry, that wants to what? I, I don't want to evict anybody. Evict anybody, okay. You know, I'm the type of person that if you're having struggles, you know what, I want to take care of you. So yes. that makes me not a perfect property manager. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. But my question <laughs> is, um, and, and I've already figured out what my problem is. Yeah. You know, if I'm renting out single family homes and somebody is not paying the rent, then from that property, I don't have any cash flow. Right. So my thoughts are if I switch my strategy and go with purchase of a multifamily property, yeah. the, the cash flow coming in from 80, 90, 95% of the tenants will cover the deadbeat sitting in the corner. Um, Here, here's what I would suggest. I would suggest, Maria, you're a lovely person. You've got a heart of gold and you're an absolutely crappy property manager. Okay, yes. um, You admit it. So if I were you and, and I am you, I'm not as nice as you are, but you know, I'm, I'm not a good, I, I listen to people sob stories as well. Remove yourself from property management immediately. It doesn't matter if it's single family homes or multifamily. Take a hit with the 10% if you're doing single family homes. That's typically what it costs for a property manager for a, a single family home. Take the hit. It's cheaper. It's cheaper to pay that 10% than to basically have one month. Uh, well, to have a, a tenant, right. a dead, be tenant not pay the rent for a month. Okay. I guess my question is, how do you find good property managers? Oh, ask around. Uh, where are you? You're in Seattle. Is you in right. Seattle, mm -hmm. right? So do you belong to local RIAs and meetups? Well, you're part of this meetup. Do you belong well, to yeah, any local one? Yeah, this is my first local meetup. Okay, uh, so I would recommend now that things are opening up again, go to some live in-person events, uh, talk with smart guys like Aaron, who, who are pretty connected, and um, you know, ask around. Recommendations, that's the best way to go. If you can't get any of those, then you're gonna have to basically interview a bunch of people and uh, probably go through a, a few different property managers till you find one that, that fits the bill. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Maria, we can we can definitely talk um, offline and uh, you know uh, set up set up a time we can talk. So look, I just want to say thank you to Dave. That doesn't mean that we're going to end the meetup, but we're going to end the recording. Uh, thank you so much, Dave, for. Um, it's great presentation and, and just sharing your knowledge as always you have, man. Just so professional and, and, and so we always giving. So I just want to say thank you so much to the attendees who attended. And uh, next week, Zena Stryker will be our guest speaker. So very, very excited. She's in construction. Um, young lady out of Atlanta who's doing big things. So very, very uh, excited for that. So we'll see you guys next week. Take care and God bless you. I think there might be one more question coming in there, Aaron. Well, we're going to stop the recording. Oh, I'm going to stop the recording. Got it. Yeah.